Um, I'm delighted to introduce Richard. Uh, Richard is the Head of Climate Impacts Research at the Met Office at Hadley Center and is also a professor at the University of Exeter. He has been a, client, a climate scientist for 28 years and is a lead author of several reports for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC. He is also currently leading the analysis for the UK's third national climate change risk assessment. Um, Richard is also very active on Twitter. Um, I'm sharing his Twitter in the group there for everyone to see. Uh, feel free um, to tweet about the talk, um, engage with him. Um, he'd love to hear from you. For now, I'm going to um, pass you along to Richard. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Katrina, for the introduction. And, uh, and thanks, everyone, for the invitation to, uh, to speak to you today. I hope you've uh, enjoyed the conference over the last uh, couple of days. Uh, it's a great honour to be asked to, to close the conference with this talk. Uh, uh, there's a potential it could be a possibly depressing talk. I hope this is not the case. And it's, uh, the idea is to inform and motivate and help you understand uh, why we need to take some action on climate change and help you perhaps uh, feel motivated to do so. Um, so it's about you know, the science of climate change and the scientific evidence and I'm going to end by talking a little bit about the discussions uh, amongst the public uh, as well. So I'm going to start with this, uh, this classic uh, satellite image from um, a weather satellite called Meteosat which we use for helping to monitor the weather and the, the climate, climate being the long-term statistics of weather. And you can see the beauty of our, our planet here uh, from space. You can see the, the great swirls of cloud, uh, stark white against the dark of the oceans. Um, you can see the evidence for different climates across the world. You can see uh, uh, the lush tropical rainforests in the Amazon on the left-hand side and the, the, the Congo Basin in the center of the picture. Uh, in North Africa, you can see the, 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 the barren Sahara Desert, a very dry climate in contrast to the wet climate of the rainforests of the Amazon and the Congo. At the top and bottom of, uh, of the picture, you can see the, uh, the white of the, um, uh, the polar ice caps. Uh, so a whole range of climates uh, across, uh, across the world. Um, climate has also changed globally uh, throughout the history of the Earth. Uh, as, as you all know, there's been ice ages in the past, so 21,000 years ago was this, uh, the peak of the last ice age. Um, going back uh, 100 or 200 million uh, years, uh, the time of the dinosaurs, the, the climate around the world is much, uh, much warmer than it is now. So climate has changed naturally um, over the whole history of the Earth. Uh, but the, uh, the, the challenge now is to understand the causes of climate change that we're seeing now and understanding our own role in this uh, as, a, as a human species. And we have a huge array of uh, data at our disposal now. The, the weather and climate is, is routinely monitored around the world, uh, day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second either. either. So there's uh, satellites like the meteor set I mentioned earlier, uh, Looking down from space, there's weather balloons, the radio sons, uh, there's uh, weather stations. Um, you may be familiar with the, the Stevenson screen, the bottom right, sort of white uh, box that looks a little bit like a beehive to some people, has uh, thermometers in it, a classic weather station tool. There's buoys on the ocean, thousands of drifting buoys in the ocean measuring the surface temperature of the sea. Measurements taken from ships and from aircraft. So we've got loads of data coming in all the time. And this has been being built up over the last decades and even the last century or more to give us a picture of what's happening uh, around the world in terms of the, uh, uh, the weather and the long-term average of climate. The other thing I'll talk about is a tool that we use for understanding uh, and predicting uh, changes in climate uh, and, and the weather, in fact. So computer models, basically mathematical models um, which represent the motion of the atmosphere and its physics and the oceans uh, and also life on Earth in the form of mathematical equations uh, which represent uh, basic physical laws such as how gases behave, how fluids flow um, and how water changes from 
water vapor into liquid water to make clouds and then falls out as rain and the the energy balance of the planet sunlight coming in sun's energy coming in some of it being reflected back to space and importantly the greenhouse effect uh, so several gases uh, including carbon dioxide but also water vapor and methane uh, act to they, they absorb some of the heat radiation given off by the surface of the earth and then they re-emit it uh, back to space and in the process they keep the earth warmer than it would have been if greenhouse gases didn't exist the planet would be frozen solid and we wouldn't be here um, and all these are factored into uh, these computer models um, the same models are used for forecasting the weather so when you see on the tv the weather forecast and the the, the, the images there this is basically the output of a computer model um, in the Met Office, we use essentially the same computer model to understand and predict climate as well. Uh, but we just keep the thing going for, instead of a few days to make the weather forecast, we run it for decades or a hundred years into the past or into the future. You can't predict the weather day by day for more than a few days ahead, but you can look at the long-term statistics and see what that's telling you about the climate. So these are the tools I'll be talking about uh, in this and the evidence for uh, the changes that we're seeing. But uh, although this is, a, this is a very modern science, um, the understanding uh, has been around for more than a century. Uh, there's just a few key figures uh, here which I wanted to, uh, to mention. Um, Eunice Foote, an American scientist, was actually the first uh, to suggest that more CO2, carbon dioxide, in the atmosphere would lead to a warmer climate. Uh, John Tyndall, the British scientist, uh, independently did some experiments um, he wasn't aware of foot actually, but he independently did some experiments um, to establish the physics of greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and water vapour and methane, as I mentioned. The Swedish scientist Arrhenius was the first to use that understanding to make calculations of warming by a buildup of CO2. And he was the first to say that actually if we carried on burning fossil fuels, coal was well into its uh, uh, widely being burned by uh, in the end of the 19th century and he predicted that would cause a warming. Guy Callender, the British steam engineer and inventor, actually discovered the world was warming as a result of that in the first half of the 20th century. Uh, and uh, Suki Manabe in the bottom right there uh, was the, he's the, uh, the founding father of climate modelling, uh, the, the tools I was just describing in the previous slide. So one of the key uh, areas of uh, science was that uh, uh, in the early 1970s, they started to use the models that Manabe and others had developed to make predictions of climate change. And actually this scientific paper in the journal Nature by one of my predecessors in the Met Office, John Sawyer, um, this made a prediction. Uh, they, they expected that carbon dioxide would rise by 25% by the end of the 20th century, by the year 2000. So he predicted using Manami's models that that would lead to an increase in global average temperature of 0.6 of a degree Celsius. So a very kind of uh, firm uh, prediction there uh, made in, 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 in the early 70s, 1972. And at that time, actually, um, not much warming had happened. And although, as I said, the calendar in the 30s had seen that global temperatures were rising. This graph here shows year by year changes in average temperature compared to the average of the last 50 years of the 19th century. So yellow is an in, uh, where an individual year is warmer, blue is where it's colder. So you can see that in the, in the 1920s, 30s and 40s, the world was starting to warm and that's what calendar found from the 50s to the 60s there was actually a slight cooling so when Sawyer made his prediction of a warming in 1972 that was quite radical because at the moment at the time they thought the, the earth was entering a, a cooling phase so his prediction as I said was for a, a 0.6 degrees celsius uh, warming by the end of the century this incidentally is based this global average temperature is based on aggregating all the data uh, if I mentioned earlier from weather stations and, uh, and satellites and ships and um, buoys on the ocean and so on. So we, we're able to now test uh, Sawyer's prediction and what actually happened was that the ongoing increase in carbon dioxide which was uh, had been measured in many places across the world including at uh, Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii that was increasing as, uh, as had been predicted by uh, Arrhenius, 
So uh, carbon dioxide had increased by about 100 parts per million since the 1950s. And that led to a warming of the global climate pretty close to what Sawyer actually predicted. He predicted 0.6 of a degree rise was actually about 0.5 of a degree. So quite a successful prediction ahead of time. So the warming that we've seen since the 1970s was predicted in advance. And then warming since the year 2000 has continued uh, as well. Uh, the world is still getting warmer. There was a period in the uh, end of the 20, 2000s, early 2010s, uh, when it looked for a few years um, as if the, uh, the one year wasn't warmer than the previous year for a few years. Um, and I may come back to that point later. That was, that was misrepresented by some as showing that global warming has stopped, but it was just a temporary blip. You can see you get year to year warming and cooling naturally on top of the long-term warming trend. So we're confident that the world is definitely getting warmer. And we're also confident this is because of the increase in carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases as predicted. And we can test this with the computer models that I've described already. Uh, but you don't even need uh, these, these uh, measurements from thermometers and satellites to show the world is warming because there's many other lines of evidence as well. For example, glaciers around the world are melting. Uh, there's many examples of these before and after pictures uh, of different glaciers. The one on the left here is the, the Pasteur's Glacier in Austria, uh, a photo taken in 1875, and then this, from the same position in 2004, you can see that glacier has shrunk right back in that particular valley, exposing the, 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 uh, the, the valley bottom. And thousands of glaciers around the world are also retreating in the same way. And the graph on the right shows how this is being monitored through all different regions of the world, from Scandinavia, uh, Canada, uh, Asia Central uh, would be the Himalayas. So all these areas are show showing a decline in ice in these, in these glacier regions. And snow cover is also declining in, in, in winter. Each winter, generally speaking, we're seeing less snow cover in the Northern Hemisphere than we used to 40 years ago. Sea ice is declining as well. Um, uh, the Greenland ice sheet is also losing ice. Parts of Antarctica are, but not everywhere in Antarctica, but parts of it. So there's signals of a warming world everywhere you, uh, you look. And this is having uh, knock-on effects uh, which, are, which are impacting on us. We're seeing more uh, heat waves now and more intense heat waves. When droughts occur, they're tending to be more severe. Uh, when forest fires occur, they also tend to be more severe. This is a photo of the, uh, the bushfires in Australia in January. The actual number of fires and the area burnt around the world is going down globally. That's because of improved management of the land. So we're not seeing more fires in terms of the number, but when they do occur, they're more severe. Uh, and it's been shown that the bushfires in Australia were made more severe by the rising temperatures due to, due to climate change. And when it's raining, that rain on the whole is now coming in heavier bursts or we're getting more intense rainfall. And in fact, on the global average, although some areas are seeing more intense droughts, on average around the world, the world's getting wetter. Rainfall is generally increasing and, and rainfall is coming in heavier bursts when it does, when it does occur. And that's increasing the risk of flooding, of course. And also an increased flooding risk from sea level rise as well. So when storms happen, because the sea level is higher, uh, that can increase the risk of damage to coastal infrastructure. This is a, a photo from uh, Dawlish down the road from uh, me in Devon, uh, which uh, some years ago, a section of the seawall was washed away in a storm and the, and the railway line collapsed. Um, and we'd expect a greater risk of this kind of thing as sea levels uh, continue to rise. Sea level rise is an inevitable consequence uh, of a warming world for two reasons. One is that ice melting on land, such as the glaciers I mentioned earlier, and ice sheets on Greenland, as that melts that puts more water into the oceans, but also water expands as it warms. So as the oceans warm, they, the, the water that's already there takes up more space. So both these things are causing the sea levels to rise. So as I said, we're, uh, we now, we've already warmed uh, the earth. And in fact, the, the world has warmed by about one degree Celsius uh, since the end uh, of the 19th century. So what do we expect uh, for the future? And we can use the, uh, the computer models that I mentioned earlier to, uh, to make 
estimates uh, of uh, future changes in, in global average temperature and, and, uh, and it's the impact of this to changes in rainfall and extreme events and so on. Um, now to do that we have to make different assumptions about how greenhouse gases such as carbon dioxide will build up in the future and that depends actually on what we assume will happen uh, as a result of human action. Are we going to continue to burn coal and oil and put more carbon dioxide uh, into the atmosphere or will we actually rein this in, um, reduce our emissions um, and have less of an impact on, uh, on the climate? Um, so we can look at several different scenarios. This shows just two of them, uh, sort of two scenarios which are banning an upper and a lower case if you like. The red is the higher emission scenario which assumes that, uh, that we not only uh, burn coal and oil and gas at the, at the rates we are doing now but actually go to a higher rate uh, of, of emissions. The red, sorry, the blue one assumes that we cut global emissions of CO2 starting now and very rapidly. Um, even if we were to do that, uh, we would still see temperatures staying quite high. And the reason for that is that once carbon dioxide is up there, it takes a very long time for it to come back out of the atmosphere. It doesn't break down through chemical reactions. Uh, it can only be uh, taken out by plants growing uh, or by absorption into the waters of the ocean um, or in the very long term by weathering processes uh, of rocks. So the best case scenario uh, would be uh, that global temperatures would, would, would stabilise, they, would, they wouldn't be falling unless we took extra action to actively suck out CO2 by some means that we're barely inventing yet. Or uh, the alternative uh, the, uh, to that is that uh, warming could continue uh, if emissions uh, continue at a higher rate. So that, that sort of shows two possibilities. So it could be up to four degrees warming by the end of the uh, uh, century if the high emissions scenario uh, were to be followed. So that raises the obvious question is that uh, yeah, what does that actually mean for us? Uh, and the, I think the most important one is it could it actually be too hot for us ultimately if we're expecting the possibility of up to four degrees warming by the end of the century what does that mean could it be too hot now when you're asking that question um, it's important to consider humidity as well as temperature uh, because uh, as you'll probably be familiar wet heat is more dangerous than dry heat if you're somewhere very humid uh, a tropical country um, if you can't sweat and cool your body because the, the, the air is very moist that it actually is more dangerous, it's more likely to lead to heat stress than a, than a dry heat. Uh, and there's very standard metrics of, of establishing the risk of heat stress from these kind of factors. Uh, there's an industry, industry st standard measure called wet bulb globe temperature. So it's not just temperature, it's a combination of temperature and humidity and solar radiation, sunlight as well. And this is the, 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 from the guidebook of the US military, um, which is which is used to show when training needs to be suspended when it's very hot and humid. Uh, and the numbers at the side are the, the critical levels of this wet ball globe temperature. And the important one I'm going to focus on is this value of 32, 32 Celsius wet ball globe temperature, which is when physical training in the military is, is basically, has to be stopped because you're risking heat stress and death if you're outside in hot, humid conditions uh, running around and you'll, you'll just overheat. So that's the definition of extreme heat stress. Now, naturally, those kind of conditions only occur quite occasionally. So the 32 Celsius wet bulb globe temperature only happens for perhaps a few days per year in the current climate. This is a map of climate simulations, um, but you get the same results from observations for the present day climate. And it's showing in, in a few parts of the tropics, so uh, in North Africa and the Indian subcontinent, for a few percent of summer days, uh, we do get this extreme risk uh, of, of heat stress. Um, and in fact, there have been some, some dreadful uh, heat waves in places like northern India in recent years, uh, with many people dying just because of uh, overheating. So the question is, would that become more of a problem under higher levels of global warming? So we can use our computer models to address this. If we are, allow our computer models to run through a climate change scenario and reach two degrees global warming, which could happen, say, around 2050 or so, roughly speaking, um, then we would see more time uh, at 
uh, with, with days at this extreme risk of heat stress, 32 Celsius threshold. So in the Indian subcontinent, perhaps 10% of summer days, maybe even 20, 30% of summer days in the far north of the Indian subcontinent would reach a peak of this, uh, this, this dangerous threshold. And across parts of North Africa, we'd see that for uh, 20 or 30 days in the summer, the uh, center of the, of the summer as well. And other parts of the tropics seeing this occur for some of the time as well. So it would be at a greater risk uh, if global warming reached two degrees Celsius. If it reached four degrees, um, it would be an even greater risk over most of the tropics. So all the countries in the tropics, so yeah, uh, 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 Brazil, uh, Ecuador, um, uh, Congo, uh, Kenya, uh, much of China, uh, North Australia, Indonesia, many of these places would be seeing uh, much of the time uh, at uh, an extreme risk of heat stress. So clearly uh, that would have major implications for the billions of people um, that live uh, in those parts of the world. The other uh, obvious consequence uh, of ongoing warming would be ongoing sea level rise. As I mentioned, sea level rise is an, ob an inevitable consequence of the warming world. And again, this shows projections of future sea level under these two scenarios of high emissions and low, uh, lower emissions. Even with the deep emissions cut scenario, which stabilizes global warming at two degrees, sea level would continue to rise because it takes a long time for glaciers to melt fully and ice sheets to fully respond. So we're committed to a certain level of sea level rise already, but with high emissions, it could be even more. So we could be seeing up to half a meter of sea level rise by the end of the century, even under the low emission scenario, possibly up to a meter or even more if we have the high emission scenario. Um, and some colleagues of mine have done a study of what this would mean uh, for Bangladesh. So this is uh, colleagues who, who are at the Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology. They are local experts in their own climate. And as you know, Bangladesh is a very low lying country and very much at risk of flooding. Uh, when they get uh, storms coming in, as happened actually uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, but this, uh, this tropical cyclone which I'm looking at here was one from 2007, which did have major impacts in Bangladesh. And what these uh, scientists have done is look, do a what if scenario, what if sea level had been higher when that storm hit, uh, would it have caused additional flooding? Because what happens in a tropical cyclone is that the low pressure draws up the ocean surface uh, and, and, and temporarily floods quite a wide area. Um, uh, that's called the storm surge. So would the storm surge have been higher uh, if sea level had been higher than it was? So this shows the actual impacts uh, uh, of the cyclone, it was called Sidda. Uh, it flooded um, 1,484 kilometers squared uh, of Bangladesh, which is 1.2% of the country, and it affected uh, 1.9 million people. I should emphasize that that's not the number of deaths, that was the people who had to be evacuated uh, to be out of harm's way. They've got a network of storm shelters. So when they see a cyclone coming, they can retreat to these shelters. But if the sea level had been half a metre higher, which, as I say, may already be locked in, if even under a low carbon emissions scenario due to the lung response of the, the oceans, if the sea level had been half a metre higher, the flooded area would have been more than double and it would have affected more than 4 million people. Um, if the sea level had been one meter higher, uh, it would have been four times the flooded area and seven million people uh, being affected. If we were to see a one and a half meter sea level rise, which is unlikely by the end of this century, but could happen in the next century, that would affect 6% of the country and 9 million people with the current population. So that means that if they're going to adapt to this, they're going to have to build their storm shelters over a much wider area than they currently have. If they can afford to do, they do it or take other measures such as build up sea defences uh, and so on. So you can see quite major impacts and the same imp implications would apply for other coastal areas, low lying areas uh, around the world. So potentially hundreds of millions of people would be at risk of flooding from sea level rise if it continues, especially at the higher rates. So the obvious question is, are we doomed? And some people are now thinking, um, Yes, this is potentially 
the end of the world. But to reassure you, this is not scientifically, uh, there's no scientific basis for these kind of statements. This is one particular uh, climate activist who, who's, who's one of the leaders of the, the New Extinction Rebellion movement who made some very outrageous statements. But his statements have been fact-checked by scientists and I can reassure we're not predicting billions of deaths. However, I think the real predictions are bad enough anyway. Um, and uh, it is still possible to avoid the worst, but we do need to act now by reducing uh, carbon emissions and emissions of other greenhouse gases if we are to avoid uh, these very severe impacts of risks of heat stress and, and coastal flooding and so on. So it's important to be aware of some of the rhetoric out there it isn't always um, uh, scientific, but there's still clearly a very uh, major problem uh, due, to, uh, due to climate change. And you get uh, false facts coming from the other side as well, of course. Um, so I mentioned earlier the, uh, the, the little blip at the, in the global temperature record of the late 2000s. Uh, Nigel Lawson uh, was one of those who um, was picked up for, for claiming that that, had sh that that had showed that global warming had gone away. I, I was actually involved in the, in the Ofcom report, which showed that he, 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 he was sort of he was making false statements which hadn't been challenged by the BBC. Uh, so, um, so you get sort of false facts, fake news from, from, from both sides really. Um, the, the science does show that climate change is real and uh, poses major threats. Now the, uh, there's a huge political movement trying to take action uh, on this. The United Nations Framework on Climate Change, Framework Convention on Climate Change has been going since the mid 90s. And in Paris at the end of 2015, they finally agreed to get all countries signed up to take action. This is the Paris Agreement. But um, it's, it, the inertia in this is so huge. Uh, it's, this is kind of the opposite of lean agile, if you like. It's slow and lumbering, this, this diplomatic process. Um, so after 25 years, they finally got to an agreement that countries would take action. And the agreement was that uh, uh, countries are aiming to hold the increase in global average temperature to below two degrees uh, Celsius, and ideally uh, limit it to 1.5 degrees. But unfortunately, these policies have not been enacted yet and actually, we're still on course for anywhere between two and a half and four and a half degrees Celsius by the end of the century. So, and this is my final slide. This, this is motivating um, ongoing public um, outrage, if you like. Uh, you'll know Greta Thunberg, who's very vocal in criticising governments. And this is Extinction Rebellion, who, despite the unscientific claims of some of their leaders, most people in the, in the movement do still accept the, the proper scientific basis for climate change and people are still urging uh, governments to take more action but it's still uh, slow coming so that was all i wanted to say and i really welcome any any questions and discussion that you uh, that you may have thank you wonderful thank you so much richard um i'm just sharing that link that we mentioned before about the um the title of your um, of your presentation. If you'd like to go over that while I give everyone the option to unmute if they prefer. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. So, so that my, my, my title was uh, uh, stolen from a song, uh, uh, the title of uh, Feeding uh, Flood and Fire. So the link is to be in the chat now. So if you're interested in, the, in this, uh, it's quite a sort of a, a poignant song, if you like, you'll see where I got the, got the title from. So do have a listen. But yeah, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any. Richard, I have a question. Yeah. So I, I work in the energy industry. Um, how can we help people using energy to look towards yeah. exploring alternatives? Um, so do you mean alternative energy sources or do you mean uh, how they're using energy? Do you mean how they're actually using energy because mm. customers at the bottom line are, are the people that drive that change yes. and we need them to to recognize that how do we do that um i would say help them be uh, uh, aware that it, that uh, their energy use does have these uh, the, the, these consequences uh so it's easy to sort of, you know, in our, in our modern life to use energy unnecessarily. Uh, you can you can still get more into the habit of, uh, of, of using, uh, using 
you know, avoiding using it in, in energy unnecessarily. And also, uh, I think within the industry, different suppliers will give choices uh, to consumers as to, you know, uh, what use, different companies will offer uh, deals which, which emphasise more renewable energy, for example. Uh, so I think, yeah, letting people know that they, that they can make a difference uh, would, would be extremely helpful, I think, yeah. I think that's going to take a lot of collaboration for people to realise that they can make that difference. But, but mm. you're absolutely right. You've called it out. Mm. It is about people, individuals collaborating together to make that difference. Mm. And, and, and the, ind the in industry also working together, uh, yeah. I, I guess, to, to give people uh, that, uh, that choice uh, yes. as well. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I can't help but feel negative about things and, we're probably, you know, as you showed, that was over 3%, the figures. And uh, I can't help but think it's going to get worse rather than better and we're going to be the higher. Yeah, I mean, this, 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 is, the, this is the worry, isn't it? You, you, you see these things and uh, uh, it is quite clear that if the world doesn't change, uh, then that that's, is, is where we're heading. Um, Things are starting to, to, to shift to some extent. A lot of people would say not fast enough, but um, the UK, for example, was the first to, um, to give itself legal obligations uh, to reduce emissions. Something called the Climate Change Act uh, was brought in uh, in 2010, uh, which committed uh, the What's UK- What's up? Can you finish up? Uh, give me three minutes. Uh, the, the commitment is now to, to go to net zero emissions uh, by 2050. Um, so that's uh, uh, re reducing emissions and also taking mm -hmm. CO2 out of the atmosphere by growing more forests and, and changing land use and, uh, and so on. So the UK has done that, but, it's, but the, an independent report uh, has shown that uh, the, the UK is, is far behind its own targets uh, right. at the moment. So yeah, things are starting to happen. But I think most people would say not fast enough to, to, to meet the commitments from the Paris Agreement. And then we've got the bigger countries like China, haven't we, and the US? Yeah, so ch uh, uh, China is starting to do things as well. But, they, uh, but uh, again, they, they're also rapidly developing. India are develop developing even more rapidly. And India in particular will say, well, the developing, developed countries have had all, you know, been able to... Yeah. Uh, use all this energy and so on why what why can't why can't we do it and so there's all these issues of equity as well and that's why it's taken such a long time to get an agreement the u.s of course the, the current administration um uh, uh, mr trump has declared it is taking the u.s out of the paris agreement in fact uh obviously they have an election later this year so we'll see what happens there but uh yeah things are starting to happen but uh most people would say not fast enough yeah but it's, it's still possible. There is still time if we get our act together. So we need to get our act together. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard. Hello. What do you think we can do, one, to prevent this kind of misinformation, such as global warming is a lie? And uh, ultimately, how do you re-educate these kind of people? Yeah, it's, that's, that, is, that is quite hard because it's a... It's a it's a classic case, isn't it? Once, once people are sort of embedded in their, in their beliefs, um, they, uh, it, it's hard to change their minds. Um, but it's important. I think well, one, one thing is to make sure that people know about things, because a lot of people, they're kind of vaguely aware of the issue, but they may not have an opinion one way or the other. So for those people, this that's the opportunity to get in and, and make sure that they do uh, know it's a, it's a real issue. When you've got actually people who are actually in, in denial, it's much harder. But sometimes it's possible to have a conversation and find out where they're really coming from. And often uh, I've found that people don't actually object to the science itself. They're, they're motivate, motivated by other reasons. They don't want to uh, see uh, yeah, ta increased taxes or whatever, you know. Um, so finding out where they're coming from can help. And then you can perhaps have a sort of deeper discussion about, well, let's separate the issue of tax from the issue of the science. But that's a harder conversation to have. But making sure the information is out there uh, is the most important thing, I think. Um, 
question, Richard. Um, about 30 years ago, a lecturer of mine was had a theory that um, global warming would actually lead to more frequent mutations of viruses and bacteria. And actually, that was just as much, if not greater, danger than the, the physical sea level rise in heat rising. Mm. Is that still considered to be a likelihood, or has that been disproved, or has it just been sort of forgotten about? That I would say more the latter. It's sort of not, not, not one way or the other, really. It's not something that okay, much yes. research um, is happening on, uh, as, as far as I'm uh, I'm aware. Uh, I mean, the uh, it's clear that the impacts on the natural world uh, are happening. Uh, I mean, not just not sort of specifically uh, you know, viruses and bacteria, but sort of uh, many of the life forms are shifting and changing. And, and like for insects, for example, and plants, uh, you're definitely seeing different ones in different parts of the world. You're seeing signs of spring happening earlier. Um, so life around the world is changing in response to climate change, specifically about sort of uh, viruses and bacteria. I, I, I don't know, I'm afraid, but it's probably, I imagine some people are still looking at it, but it's not a hot topic. Maybe, maybe even more, maybe, maybe it will come back now, the, now we've had coronavirus. Yeah. Good question though. Thank you. Yes. Um, sorry to quickly interrupt if someone else was about to go, but Richard, there's a couple of um, questions in the chats that I was hoping I could let you know about just for those that don't have their yeah. microphones on. Right, yeah. um, the first question is from David. He said, what are sensible estimates about the impact of climate change on hydric stress and food supply? Uh, for food supply, um, it's a very wide range uh, of estimates uh, and and you'll, you'll probably get this kind of answer for, for a lot of sort of future predictions due to climate change because the uncertainty is quite quite large as uh, not only because we don't know what the um, how much the greenhouse gases are going to build up but we also don't know for sure how the climate will um, uh, will respond um, and with food it's even harder um, because you have the as well as the largely negative effects of climate change the heat stress uh, high temperatures changing drought impacts of flooding and so on you do have actually to some extent the beneficial effect of, of higher carbon dioxide which helps crops mm -hmm. grow more so in some cases you, you could get in the northern parts of the world uh it's a across russia and canada you could get increased yields to start to start with uh, but at the same time, the tropics will almost certainly get decreased yields um, because of the, the, the offset of much higher temperatures and greater droughts uh, and so on. And also the benefits of higher CO2 don't go on forever. They tail off uh, at some point. Um, but beyond crop yields, uh, there's also the sort of effects of actually getting the food from where it's grown to the people that need it. So food security doesn't just affect isn't just affected by can you grow the stuff it's actually can you transport it to market can people afford to buy it and so on um, and uh, again in the in the in the developing countries which happen to be mostly in the tropics which are the most severely at risk from the, the physical aspects of climate change that's where these other risks these socioeconomic risks to food security are also there so most places which would be counted as developing countries would be at increased risk of food insecurity uh, that could have knock-on effects through the rest of the world um, of, through food prices and so on. I probably wouldn't want to put any numbers on things, but I think it's quite clear uh, that, um, that food insecurity would be a greater issue, especially in the developing world, uh, even under lower levels of, uh, of climate change. We're probably not going to run out of food for the whole population of the world, um, so it's not an extinction level thing, but it's clearly food, food insecurity is a major issue for the developing uh, world. And that's why it's still important that they can develop uh, and, and be able to afford food. Lovely. And um, I, I forgot that another part of the question about, was it about water, about water availability? Was I was it? about uh, hydric stress. Yeah. I'm not sure what, if, if that means about water, uh, then similar kind of answer, really. Um, many places will be increased risk of water insecurity because of drought or because of reduced water quality or because of flooding because flood water even though you've got more water it's usually dirty so 
it's a it's a kind of lose lose either way. Lovely, thank you. Um, the next question um, is from Juliana. She said, "I'm curious to know what practices you adopt in your daily life to avoid these consequences, and do you recommend that we as individuals do it as well?" So, thank you for that. Uh, I, I I don't like to rec like to make specific. I don't like to tell people what to do, but I'm have, very happy to share what I have done. Um, so. The last two times I've moved house, um, I've chosen to live in a place near a train station so I can use public transport. Um, I don't have a car myself. Uh, I get everywhere on the train or cycling or walking in the, lo in the local area. I'm a member of a car club, uh, uh, which means I can, uh, I can use a car if, if I want it uh, from time to time. And, and the, car, the local car club have a lot of electric vehicles. So that's one thing I, uh, uh, I've done is to actively use public transport and not have my own car. Um, I, uh, I eat less meat. Uh, I'm not a vegetarian, uh, but I uh, consciously eat less meat, uh, especially when I'm eating out. I find, I find that uh, choosing the veggie option in restaurants it is it opened up a whole new experience to me, actually. So I'm enjoying that. I don't eat beef because beef farming, cattle farming is... is uh, has quite a high carbon footprint and well it, and actually it's not just carbon it's also methane emissions from cattle uh methane is a very strong greenhouse gas so i've chosen not to eat uh, beef these days i may crack at some point and <laughs> go back and have a burger but i'm trying not to um i'm also very conscious about my energy use in my daily life as i was we were talking about in response to the first question as well um but the other thing actually the most important thing is use democracy in actual fact. Uh, you can choose through voting, uh, not only at the national level, but also at the local level uh, to influence the people who are making these big changes. Because I think individual changes can only go so far. Uh, I think it's quite clear that system level changes at the national and global level are what's really needed. And actually we have an opportunity at the moment um, Many local authorities have got funding from the government uh, in the UK. This is for those who are in the UK. Uh, UK local authorities have got funding for active travel, so putting in new place, place new bike lanes, uh, and so on, and, and pedestrianising certain areas in response to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, but if you were, if you were minded to let the local authorities know that you like these things that you never know they may become permanent so there's individual things but also there's using democracy uh, voting and actually writing to people in power that's how you can make a difference if you want to um so this one um is from um, indrajit it's a uh, lot there's lots of talks about lithium batteries for example tesla as as a future of domestic energy will this shift be a problem elsewhere in regards to mining and natural resources so that's a great question which unfortunately is somewhat out of my expertise because i uh, deal with the sort of the, the, the climate side of things rather than the sort of the resources side i mean that there's never any such thing as a free lunch, I suppose, is the answer, isn't it? Everything that we do has some kind of consequences. So I guess this comes back to the, the earlier question about reducing energy demand. Um, if you are using energy, it's got to come from somewhere. Even if you're using new technology, some of which uses batteries for storing electricity from renewable energy, then there's still some kind of cost. I don't know the exact answer to that, but it still underlines how you need to be mindful of everything that you do, I think. Lovely, thank you. Um, I'm gonna combine two questions that are relatively similar. So hopefully you can answer it kind of in a two part. Um, mm. From Eduardo and Jose, I have, um, with everything that happens during the pandemic, was stopping beneficial as well? Um, do you think the pandemic is a warning from the ecosystem um, that a systematic change is needed? Um, either we do it or nature is gonna be doing it for us. So um, on the second one, uh, I'm I'm not really sure I'm, uh, that that would kind of imply that the uh, uh, the natural world has some kind of conscious thought behind it. Which I mean, there's probably a philosophical d d debate to be had there. Maybe we can talk about that in Sokoko with a beer later. The first part I can answer because I made those calculations myself. Um, the global emissions of carbon dioxide. Uh, 
fell by about 8%, I think it was, um, on average in the start of the year. And we actually made some calculations for what that meant for the buildup of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Unfortunately, the impact was quite small. Uh, a reduction, an 8% reduction in emissions was not enough to slow the buildup of CO2. CO2, carbon dioxide, it's carried on building up in the atmosphere, but just not quite as much um, as it would have done without. So, uh, and, this, and this is illustrates the point I was saying earlier about the limits of individual action, because we all stopped driving around, we all stopped flying. Um, we did as much as we could just uh, personally, um, and yet energy use globally continued, CO2 emissions continued, and it still continued building up in the atmosphere, because we were still heating our homes, doing work, using the internet, growing food, um, transporting food, buying stuff off Amazon or whatever. Um, so things still happened. So it just shows that it's a system level change is what's really needed as well as individual action, which can help, but it's not the whole thing. Lovely, thank you. Um, and just the final question that we'll do in, um, in this session, sorry if I didn't make it to your questions, um, but again, Richard um, will be in Sokoko um, if, to answer the other questions. But the last one I have is from Don. Um, he says, do you think we have a full systematic understanding of what the impacts could be, or might there be as yet unforeseen and worse circumstances ahead? Uh, there could be. Yes, I think no scientists would claim to have perfect understanding and, uh, and knowledge. We're, we're, we're pretty comprehensive in, in what we're, we're covering. But as I said, the, these projections do come with a, sort of a, a certain amount of uncertainty. Um, so uh, if you're taking a sort of a, you know, a, a, risk, uh, a risk assessment approach, uh, this only, the, the fact that we're not certain only underlines the severity of the, uh, uh, of the situation. We can't predict perfectly. Uh, the uncertainty is not our friend. If you get people saying, oh, scientists can't predict future climate change and therefore we shouldn't worry about it, I think it's the opposite. We can't make perfect predictions and therefore we don't know the full extent of the risks. So I think that's a great question to, to finish on. Thank you. Yeah.